Each episode, we will be interviewing a professor on campus and get a chance to learn things about them you may not have known before. So without further ado, here is Janae Randall with Professors Exposed. Hello everyone and welcome to our new edition of Seahawk Central News, Professors Exposed. I'm Janae Randall and today I will be interviewing Dr. Weber from the Communications Studies Department. Dr. Weber, during your class you often discuss culture, cultural differences, and even cultural identity. What experiences have you personally had with this? I've had a lot of experiences, Janae, um, both in travel and in my professional work. I guess I got started with this sort of thing. I dropped out of college after four years. I was actually in my senior year of college, but I wasn't really accomplishing as much as I'd like, mm -hmm. and I just needed a break, so I dropped out of school for what turned out to be a year, put a backpack on my back, and lived in Europe and traveled around. Sort of the classic, you know, young 20s, I was 21, young 20s sort of uh, Wanderjahr. They have mm -hmm. a name for it in German, oh. Wanderjahr, <laughs> wandering year. And that's what got me sort of started because mm -hmm. I had limited interest in culture and travel prior to that time, but that mm -hmm. turned me around. Great. Now, where exactly have you had the opportunity to travel? I've traveled primarily in Europe and Asia and the Mideast. Mm -hmm. um, in 1974, when I dropped out of school, that was a European sojourn. Mm -hmm. And I saw basically all of the Western European countries. Oh. I, 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 I didn't get into Eastern Europe because in those days that was closed, mm -hmm. but I did go to Greece. And then in the 80s, I worked in Asia and was able to go all over Asia. Basically, I went almost everywhere except Burma. Never got to Burma. Oh. In those days, Vietnam was closed. And then uh, I worked in Iran for a year. I did not actually do much traveling in, in that part of the world mm -hmm. when I lived there for a variety of reasons. And um, so I've been, to, uh, I've been to a total of about 31 countries, wow. either living or visiting, which That's is not a large number, but certainly it's more than some people also. That's certainly an impressive number. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, of all the places that you have had the opportunity to visit, mm -hmm. which would you say was your favorite? Probably, I would say, two. It's, it would be hard to decide between France mm. and Japan. Oh. I can speak some French. I'm not fluent, but I can speak some French. And so now, whenever I go to France, I almost feel not quite like I'm at home, <laughs> but it really feels like uh, a homey place to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I like French culture. I like French music. When A few years ago, when... France was getting a bad rap by the American government mm. for not supporting some of its political goals. I always felt bad because I, I always have loved France. And then Absolutely. Japan, I, I love the aesthetics mm. of Japan, Japanese design. I could speak some Japanese. Really? Um, oh. there's, there is so much to do in Tokyo. It's, mm -hmm. it, at the time, at least, it was probably the most modern city in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I like the Japanese people. They're very friendly, very correct, but mm -hmm. very friendly. And, and uh, I may have mentioned the food is outstanding. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, but what in particular would you say about the cultures of Japan and France? Would you say that you felt at home to, or mm -hmm. would you say that you felt, um, should you say, more comfortable in those cultures? With France, I think that there is a certain this comes to mind, this mm -hmm. is not necessarily the, the only thing, but it comes to mind. There's a certain appreciation mm -hmm. of the intellect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, France is famous for, French culture is mm -hmm. famous for sort of balancing an appreciation for the intellect and an appreciation for the, the sensual uh, part of human life, mm -hmm. you know, really enjoying food, really enjoying wine, mm -hmm. but also really valuing intellectual interchange. So when I encounter French people who are English speaking, or, or if the conversation is enough that I can participate mm -hmm. in French, right. um, the interchange tends to be at a sort of an intellectual level, mm -hmm. which I sort of enjoy. Absolutely. As far as Japan, I think it would be the, um, I think it's the sense, I talked about the Japanese aesthetic. I like the fact that everything in Japan, even the most humble meal in uh -huh. the smallest restaurant is served just right. Mm -hmm. It's put on the plate just so. Everything is, is imbued with importance, all mm -hmm. moves of, of, of an action. Mm -hmm. And most Japanese have something that they do very, very well. Um, 
what we might call a hobby in Japanese culture is elevated to something of particular importance. Uh -huh. And you put a lot of time and effort into it, be it flower arranging or the tea ceremony or martial arts. And I really appreciate that sort of that fine attention to perfection mm -hmm. and the, the pursuit of perfection and the, the attention to detail. Great. So that would be, for those two countries, that would be, that would be it. Okay. What would you say would be your most memorable experience in either Japan or France or any of the Anywhere other countries else? you visited? Mm -hmm. I would say I have so many experiences to draw from. Uh, one that comes to mind happened not in France or in Japan, but happened in Cuba. Um, just, just over a year ago, I was in Cuba for about mm -hmm. a week and a half. It was a convention that I attended and participated mm -hmm. in. But I went there early and I stayed there a little longer so that I could sort of experience Havana, uh -huh. which is really only where I went. I didn't go around the country. Mm -hmm. Transportation is very difficult in Cuba. Public transportation scarcely exists. <laughs> really not very much. So I sort of explored Havana. Yeah. Well, at a certain point, I was with another conference attendee. We threw in our money together, rented a cab for the day to take us around Havana. Mm -hmm. And we were standing around, and the cab driver was telling us some things about what he disliked about the Cuban government. And um, we said, are, are you potentially going to be in trouble by saying this to us? And he looked around and he pointed to this group of people on the street corner and a couple of people were in uniform, a couple of people were in civilian clothes, a couple of other people were wearing white shirts and blue slacks and a kind of a belt with um, um, a truncheon, on, uh -huh. you know, like a billy club mm -hmm. and uh, telecommunications equipment. And he said, if any of those people on that corner heard me saying what I'm saying, I'd be in jail. Really? And yeah, and it just, it, I realized that throughout my stay in Cuba, I had always seen on many, many street corners these collections of four, five, six people. That same group of uniform, civilian clothes, and then this odd, not odd, but this sort of this semi-uniform of white top and blue mm -hmm. bottoms, standing around just looking at, at street corner after street corner. So it's a very scrutinized society. Mm -hmm. And um, the vibe was a little uncomfortable for me, but yet, it's the people were very friendly. Mm -hmm. The breeze was the gentlest I've ever experienced. Yeah. I mean, I love the weather. Yet the government is so and, and the government has unlike this, here in America. Yes, yeah. the government has this presence, mm -hmm. and you're just aware of it. And this guy was, he knew he was tempting fate yeah. by, by saying some of the things. Wow. Looking back, how do you feel that your past experiences have influenced you today? Well, you know, a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and I'd say probably the main one is to cause me to look at so many things that happen to me from a, as, as different a perspective as I can summon up. Mm -hmm. I think that my experience is living overseas, and I, I haven't lived overseas for long periods of time, but I've, I've lived overseas for about six years mm -hmm. um, in Iran, um, Japan, and Indonesia and uh, for a couple of years each, a few oh. years each. And um, that experience, as well as travel, but especially living overseas, it really kind of caused me to adopt a perspective of what I know may not be right. Mm -hmm. What I know may be just another way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And that all of these millions of people that I'm interacting with in this place, in this country, in this village, in this city, mm -hmm. they may have a completely different perspective that is absolutely as good as mine. Absolutely. on whatever the topic is. Mm -hmm. And so I think I would summarize that as a kind of a humility that you acquire when you True. expose yourself to other cultures. Right. Now has seeing other countries, I'm sure you've seen other countries that aren't as, um, aren't as fortunate as we are here mm -hmm. in the United States. Do you feel more appreciative when you come back to the States after having visited other foreign countries? Well, I, you know, I, I, I guess I would say I sort of do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't live, I, I try to live with as light a footprint as possible, mm -hmm. but, you know, we are the nation that consumes, what, 25% of all resources and so forth, so it's very That's difficult right. to have that That's light of footprint just mm -hmm. by being a middle-class American. Um, but uh, that being said, what I, what I guess I appreciate when I come back here more than just the stuff that I have access to. Mm -hmm. I guess I appreciate, the reason why I would live here um, indefinitely, 
as mm -hmm. opposed to living anywhere else indefinitely. Mm -hmm. This is where my roots are. Yeah. This is where I know the culture best. This is where I speak the language best. Mm -hmm. Talking, arguing, language use, that's very important to me in my life. And mm -hmm. if I were in a situation where for an indefinite period of time I couldn't engage in that, mm -hmm. if I had to go somewhere, even France where I speak the language a little bit, or, or, or a Spanish-speaking country where I can kind of get around, mm -hmm. the time it would take for me to get to a level that I'd want to get to to be able to engage in the kind of activity that's really important to me, yeah. to really consume cultural products like movies and theater and lyrics to songs, mm -hmm. that would take so much time that you know, I would, I, 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 I just wouldn't be happy because I couldn't do that except for here. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I, I do consider myself more of an internationalist than a hundred percent pure and simple American. Absolutely. I, I think that my American identity has been conditioned mm -hmm. by having a sense of the world mm -hmm. of which America is a part. Right. True. Now, since you traveled. Primarily when you just left college, mm -hmm. what advice would you give for either future college graduates mm -hmm. or students who are currently in school? What, what advice would you give to them to travel abroad or for those who are considering mm -hmm. traveling abroad? Three words, hit the road. <laughs> Four <laughs> words, hit the road, Jack. Uh, <laughs> but hit the road. What I mean is go somewhere. Uh -huh. I think that our students at UNCW tend to be somewhat isolated mm -hmm. because here we are in a little corner of the world that is literally apart from, uh, except for I-40, it really yeah. is more or less inaccessible except you know, by, by water or by air. We're inaccessible to readily, in, in, uh, accept, mm -hmm. we're not readily accessible to the world. Um, we tend to all love Wilmington and we like the lifestyle here and we get a little bit seduced by the pleasures of being here and we often don't stretch ourselves. I mean, it, it was about six or seven years between my last trip and my first trip thereafter, after coming here, mm -hmm. you know. I had to really make myself leave Wilmington to revisit mm -hmm. the international world. Um, so I think my one just my one suggestion is do something that's going to get you out of Wilmington, out of North Carolina, out of the South, out of America, and test yourself. Mm -hmm. my, my second piece is related, and I would say do something that's going to stretch you. A lot of our students, for example, go to Australia for study abroad uh, for a year. And I, I love Australia. I've been there. I, I think it's a wonderful place. Um, my cousin married an Australian guy, so I have a sort of a family connection mm -hmm. there, too. So I have no problem with Australia whatsoever. But it's not a stretch. Yeah. My time in Australia, I definitely did not stretch me the way that my time in Cuba did or my mm -hmm. time in China did. Um, uh, Nepal, all these different places that are so vastly different from us where yeah. you, you just don't know how to express yourself. You don't know how to ask for something you need. Um, so I'd say hit the road and stretch yourself when you do. That is some great advice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Weber. That seems to be all the time we have today. Um, once again, thank you, Dr. Weber, for your time and for your contribution. I'm Janae Randall, and back to you, Kara. Thank you, Janae, for that awesome interview and for kicking off our brand new segment. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of Seahawk Central News. Special thanks to UNCW TV and the Communications Studies Department for making our show a possibility. Even more thanks to Bill Denholm and Dustin Miller. Check out the latest edition of the Seahawk at newsstands all over campus. Remember, you can keep up with Seahawk Central News by stopping by youtube.com slash chilltv2010. I'm Kara Trotter. And I'm Sarah Lively, saying so long, Seahawks. <laughs>